is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, this podcast today, I want to talk about a 2012 sermon that was delivered by one of our favorite pastors while under some pretty awkward circumstances to say the least. So this was a sermon that was delivered by Matt Chandler. Okay. So you guys have heard me talk about Matt Chandler a lot on this podcast. If you go back, I even did an entire podcast episode, episode number 14 about his latest book. But if you don't know who Matt Chandler is, let me go ahead and bring you up to speed. Aside from the fact that we just absolutely love him here at Undaunted Life. Like we just love everything that he's done, everything that he stands for and the things that he said. He's personally my favorite pastor. I have a lot of guys that I really respect, a lot of guys that I've read their books and I've listened to their sermons and I've taken a lot of notes, but Matt Chandler is the guy above every other guy. I just love everything that he does and everything he stands for. So he is the lead pastor of the Village Church, which is in the Dallas area. So when Chandler was 28 years old, he became the church's pastor. So this was in 2002 and he's been there ever since. So when he got there, the church was under a different name. It's a Baptist church. Um, and there were about 160 people coming every week, right? Um, and he took it over. And now today there are more than 10,000 weekly attenders uh, of this church. And so the village is currently a multi-site church in the Dallas area. So they're kind of spread out throughout the Metroplex. Um, but they are currently in the process of working all of their campuses towards becoming autonomous churches. So basically the reason was that I think last year he announced this or maybe the year before that, but I think it was by 2020 was the, the what the year that they were going for. But by 2020, they wanted every one of their churches to be serving the communities that they're in because they have they have some and just spread out in all different areas. And so you can look at it as, oh, well, they're all in Texas and they're all kind of in the same area, but all those communities are fairly unique. And so the church and the eldership kind of came together and unanimously decided that they were going to work in that direction. And so I, I thought that was incredibly cool. And we've we've seen some other churches that were multi-site actually kind of decide that they were going to do that as well. So it's kind of an incendiary thing that they decided to do. Um, he's also the current president of the Acts 29 network. So if you're not familiar with Acts 29, that is a, a network of church planting churches. Okay. So in this, these are churches that are on every continent except Antarctica, right? So the, these are people that are um, planting churches and doing things that are all over the place. And so uh, if you go to the Acts 29 website, you can actually look up your area, like plug in your zip code and do those different things. And you'll be able to actually see the Acts 29 churches that are in your area. So they all kind of, uh, you know, ascribe to a, a certain way of doing things. And so it's not like a one size fits all, like, you know, it's not like a, um, I'm just trying to think of, the, of, of be, the best way to describe it. It's not something where it's like, okay, everyone has to preach a certain way and they have certain music or anything like that. It's not anything like that, but it just kind of puts all the churches in the same mind frame in terms of how they're going to do church. Um, he wrote the book, The Explicit Gospel. That is one of my favorite books, The Explicit Gospel. It's on our book list, The 100 Books Every Modern Christian Man Should Read. It's it's easily a top five book for me. Um and it's just, he's an incredible guy that's led an incredible life, but he's not been without, you know, his, his pain and his trials either. So if you know anything about Matt Chandler, you know that, uh, in thanks on the Thanksgiving day in 2009, he suffered a seizure at his home. Uh, the same day he's obviously rushed to the hospital and they did an MRI and the MRI showed that he had a tumor in the frontal lobe of his brain. So he had cancer, right? So he went under, or he, he underwent 18 months of radiation and chemotherapy and, you know, he got to the end of the 18 months and he, he had beaten cancer. And since then, he I think he does a scan once per year and the scans have all been clean up to this point. Um, but one thing that you'll know if you followed him for any uh, length of time, this is a guy that he preaches like he's playing with house money, right? But because, you know, he had bad cancer. The dude should probably be dead. Like they were praying for this guy like he was going to die but he's not dead. He, he's still here. He's still crushing it almost a decade later. Um, but the thing is, is he kind of is playing with house money. And I think he knows it because he's always kind of been a very powerful and very boisterous presenter and preacher, but it's just kind of been amplified since he went through the cancer thing. So I find it amazing that the sermon that I'm, we're going to be talking about today, that I had never heard it until this last week. There was a buddy that shared it on Facebook and I just saw that he shared a video with Matt Chandler in it. So I was like, oh man, I love Matt Chandler. He's like my spirit animal or whatever. But then I actually went and watched it and I was blown away, just completely 
floored by this. Um, it, it's been considered by many folks to be one of the best sermons ever delivered. So if you if you look kind of in the Reformed communities, this is kind of one of the anchor things that they point to, and not just for the sermon content, but because of the circumstances with which it was presented, and I can absolutely see why. So let me go and give you guys kind of the setup, because the sermon itself is great, but the setup really kind of accentuates some of the things that were going on. So uh, there's a guy online, actually, his name is Tim Challies, I think is how you say his last name. C-H-A-L-L-I-E-S, Chalice, Chalice, we'll say Chalice, okay? Um, So on his website, he actually did a really, really great job of kind of setting up and summing up this sermon. So he had like a 11 or 12 minute YouTube video and the link to that video is in the description. So some of this summary is going to be coming directly from him. So I want to make sure I give him credit for that. So basically this sermon went down in January of 2012. And in terms of where it went down, this was at Elevation Church's Code Orange Revival. So this was kind of like a 12-night event to begin the year, and it was going to be with a lot of different speakers and a lot of music and worship and different things. And so if you're familiar with Elevation Church, you know that it was started by Stephen Furtick. So this was started by Stephen Furtick in 2006 when Furtick was just 25 years old. He started in North Carolina, and the church launched with about 100 people in attendance. But today, I think in the last uh, annual report, it showed that they are averaging well over 25,000 weekly attenders now. So from 100 to over 25,000. So explosive, explosive growth. But there's kind of a rub here, right? So of course, Matt Chandler was brought in, but there's an entire backstory that made it even crazy that he was even invited. So um, the rub here a little bit is that from a philosophy standpoint, like church philosophy, Stephen Furtick and Matt Chandler are really on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you have a guy like Furtick who is like a growth and grace guy. So about the growth of the church and the growth of the ministry, and it's very, very grace focused. So very similar to maybe, you know, an Andy Stanley or Rick Warren or Bill Hybels, Craig Rochelle, Brian Houston, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Matt Chandler is more of a reformed theology guy, right? So a la John Piper, John MacArthur, J.I. Packer, those types of folks. But then also, uh, Furtick and Chandler are very different when it comes to their sermon content. So Furtick is, you know, basically what God can do through us. So that's that's kind of an overarching theme to a lot of his sermons is what God can do through us. Whereas Matt Chandler is very much more of a what God did for us. So what God can do through us versus what God did for us, right? So, but I mean, there's plenty of, of big time pastors out there that their paths never cross, so it's no big deal, but their differing styles kind of came to a head at um, an event called the Elephant Room in 2011. So basically the Elephant Room is where they bring pastors in and they put them on, um, they, they pair them up to discuss controversial topics, right? And these are things that are, you know, societal or things inside the church versus things outside the church. And so they normally try to uh, get pastors that are on different sides of issues so that they can kind of come in and discuss different things. So Chandler and Furtick were given the topic of the purpose of the church. So basically, why is the church here? And so Chandler, um, in in this discussion, he kind of busted Furtick for saying that evangelism and doctrine are exclusive. I'm even just saying that now seems a little bit crazy that evangelism and doctrine are exclusive. But Uh, Chandler made this because, uh, or he said this because it was in reference to a sermon that Stephen Furtick delivered in 2008, where he was quoted as saying this. So here's the quote. And over 500 people have given their lives to Jesus for the first time in this church in the last five months. That's over a hundred people per month. If that doesn't get you excited and you need the doctrines of grace as defined by John Calvin to excite you, you're in the wrong church. So Tim Chalese summed this up very well. He said, quote, this reveals a key difference between Furtick and Chandler. Furtick deliberately downplayed deep doctrine for the sake of growing his church. Chandler, though, was absolutely convinced that deep doctrine was essential for bringing true and healthy growth to his church, end quote. So um, with all that kind of being said and with that kind of awkward, contentious meeting that they had at the Elephant Room, fairly amazingly, Stephen Furtick invited Matt Chandler to come and speak at Elevation Uh, Elevation Church's Code Orange Revival that very next year. So the Elephant Room happened in 2011, and in January of 2012, he was on the docket of speakers. And so uh, the headliners were guys like T.D. Jakes and Craig Rochelle and Christine Kane and Perry Noble. And so Chandler's style and philosophy are obviously very different than the other speakers. So I'm sure some of you have heard some of those other speakers 
maybe you're familiar with their style, but it's very, very different than Matt Chandler. And so essentially every night there were hundreds of people that waited in line to see these speakers. And so, uh, and I mean, apparently it was like really bad weather during this time. So these people that got inside, there were thousands of people inside actually. And then there was also thousands more watching via live stream. So this was, this was a pretty big deal. But one thing I want to make sure that you guys do is I'm about to break down the sermon and kind of the things that, that I got from it and the things that were really important, but I want you to go watch this sermon like right now. And if you're driving, do not watch the sermon. That's dangerous. But um, I provided the link in the description for this podcast to the actual sermon. So it's about 54, 55 minutes long. Um, and I want you to watch it before you hear what I have to say about it. Okay. Because I'm going to summarize it in a way that, you know, fits kind of what I'm doing and what I have a feeling towards, but I don't want that to sully you listening to it for the first time. So I I'd, I'd prefer for you to listen to it and then come in and you can kind of get my summary and see if it kind of goes with some of the things that you pull from it. Okay. So right now, pause this podcast, go open up that YouTube link. If you're driving, do not watch the video, set your phone face down or something like that. But I just want you to hear what Matt Chandler has to say. So go ahead and do that now. Okay. So if you're back, if you're unpaused, hopefully you got a chance uh, to watch that all the way through and were able to pay attention. So I want to kind of go through some of the big things that I, I got from this and some of the things that I noticed. So obviously this was titled God is for God. And uh, that is an in- incredible title because it really does in four words encapsulate the entire reason why Matt Chandler was there. So uh, it started out with a, a pretty slobbering intro from Furtick. So the first time I watched it, I actually skipped the first five minutes that Furtick was doing his intro just because I, w- I just wanted to hear what Matt Chandler had to say. But I went back and watched that. And, you know, Furtick was just, he talked about the elephant room and, you know, he talked about how he wanted to bring different people with different points of view in and all those different things. And it was just kind of buttering everybody up. And and you're almost thinking to yourself, uh, man, this is, this is going well. Like maybe, maybe this is something where he's actually wanting to embrace these different, different viewpoints and things like that. Uh, but as you can see, as we talk about a little bit later, it wasn't necessarily the case. So one thing that was kind of weird from the beginning is that Stephen Furtick brought up what he called auxiliary a minors. And so the stage was like chock full with people sitting on like these, these couches and these little, the chairs, like to the left and to the right of the speaker. And so it was kind of weird and did, you know, very different because normally you just see one speaker up there. And if there's like a panel discussion, you'll see multiple people. So that was, that was kind of weird. So it was kind of a strange lead up. There was tons of emotion and there was like this big applause and Stephen Furtick made sure everybody did this big standing ovation for him when he came up. But Chandler pretty much shut that stuff down, like with the quickness. So after about two or three seconds of the standing ovation and after Chandler realizes, all right, my mic's on, it's ready to go. He literally screamed, sit down, sit down. Like, it was just like, that's, you know, stop it. Like I get that y'all are, you know, clapping because your pastor just told you to, but sit down, let's get after it. And so one of the incredible things is Chandler just really gets right at the heart of what he's there for from the very beginning. He doesn't really wade in or kind of slowly make his way in. He said he really wanted to get to the bottom of what was going on in the room. And he was very, very adamant. This again is in the first couple of minutes that he's speaking. He wanted to go beyond Code Orange Revival. Okay. He wanted to get beyond Elevation Church. He wanted to go beyond Stephen Furtick to what is God up to. But considering the contentious past that these two pastors had had and kind of the the awkward interactions, it it was a pretty intense way to start. Because he was like, man, I love Code Orange and Elevation and Stephen Furtick, but that's not why we're all here. And we've got to be realistic about why we're all here. So that was a pretty, pretty powerful way for him to start. And so he immediately went on uh, basically how happiness and joy are not equal. That was kind of one of the first main points that he made in this sermon. And he talked about how easily happiness disappears and how if you treat it as anything other than something that's flippant, it could, you could run into issues. And so one of the, one of his quotes there was, if you live long enough, you'll bleed. And that's just basically his way of accentuating that, you know, even if you haven't felt pain up to this point in life, it is coming like it is coming for us all. Uh, and even, I, I think all of you will remember from, I think it was our very first Q and a podcast. Uh, there was a question about basically the advice I would give to a young college student that was, you know, going to college for the, for the first time. And I talked about how the two worst pieces of advice that you could give a young person or someone that's entering the workforce is number one, follow your heart. And number two, do what makes you happy. 
And the reason why I talked about with, you know, the do what makes you happy thing is because happiness is on this single continuum and it's so flippant and so easily lost, right? So you reach in your pocket and you find a hundred bucks that you didn't know was there, you know, you're happy or, you know, you and your wife have been trying to get pregnant for a while. And then she announces to you that she's pregnant, happy, right? That's all on the same continuum. And those things can so easily be taken away, right? And they're, they're just not equal to joy. And Chandler really gave fair warning about uh, where he was going to be going within the speech, right? About what he was going to be talking about in terms of joy and happiness. So I, I pulled a quote out here. So here's a quote. All it takes is one thing and your happiness is gone. So look at me. I am not interested in boosting, encouraging, or helping your happiness because I believe it's cheap. And I believe that it will not sustain you for the journey that God has you on. So what I am for and what I am after is your joy. And sometimes getting to joy stings. And so if some of the, this stings tonight, know that ultimately I come as an ambassador of Christ for your joy. So this was kind of one of those things at the very beginning where people weren't really sure, am I supposed to be clapping right now? Like he kind of just said something that was contrary to every other speaker we've seen and the things that we've seen preached from the same pulpit by our main pastor. But, you know, it just kind of kept going from there. So the big point that he made is, and it's really an overarching point for his entire sermon that he delivered, is that God's motivation in everything is himself. Again, the, the title of this thing is God is for God, right? And he starts out with uh, talking about Psalm 23, 1 through 3, <clears throat> because when you read these these verses, you're like, man, God is for me. God must be like my biggest fan. God must be like all over me, just loving on me right now. And so Psalm 23, one through three, it starts like this. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. But then this is where he draws a line. This is where he draws a line because the very last part of verse three is that he leads me in paths of righteousness, and here it is, for his name's sake. And so he also, after he talks about Psalm 23, he goes into several dozen other Old Testament and New Testament scriptures saying pretty much the same thing, that God is for God. The last one that he talked about was Revelation 21, and it was verse 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So basically, Jesus, at some point, whenever everything is set back to new, he's going to be more important than that burning ball that we pretty much are centered on at this point, right? So God is not for us like we've been taught. Like we, we've we been shown for the majority of our lives in a lot of different ways that God is here for us, like that that he is that basically the entire universe is centered on us. Culture is telling us that we're intrinsically valuable. It tells us that we deserve so much. Um, and we really are taught that the center of the universe is our place. But the reality is, guys, and this is the big thing that he talks about, is that God is for God. God is about his glory. And there was something really big while he was talking during this section that um, I don't know if most people picked up on it, but it was, it was awkward for me. And I was watching it, you know, like seven years after it happened or six years after it happened. But Chandler, after he got through talking about how the universe is not about us or that, that God is not, a, you know, for us in the same way that we think that the way society has told us it is, he said, unfortunately, it doesn't get preached very much either. He paused and then he said it again. Unfortunately, it doesn't get preached much either. And so here he is standing at the, on the pulpit of a church that has kind of had that style where, you know, God is for us. You know, we are the center of the universe. That's something that you see a lot in Stephen Furtick's sermon. So it's very interesting that he made sure to drive that point home twice with Stephen Furtick sitting, you know, not 15 feet away from him. So one of the next sections he talks about is basically that the, the Bible isn't about us either. So I thought this was pretty interesting. I've heard people say something, you know, similar to this and similar different types of context, but you know, the Bible has been t- said by a lot of people that it's it's the roadmap for life, right? So you'll hear a preacher say that or you hear someone say that the Bible is a roadmap for us. This is how we should live. And so this was Matt Chandler's quote in reference to that. Ultimately, it's not the roadmap to life. If you think that way, you'll read the Bible wrong. What you'll do is you'll keep infusing yourself into the stories of the Bible like you're the hero. This happens all the time. I want to be straight. I love you enough to be straight. You're not David. Your trouble in life is not Goliath. And if that's true, 
you're in a lot of trouble, bro, because you miss. You fling your stones and you miss. And Goliath is still there. And now what? Well, I had five. You'll miss all five. So if you view the scriptures through the lens that all the superheroes of the Bible are actually you, then you've put a weight on your shoulders that, listen to me, you will not be able to bear. Again, I'll say the last line again. You've put a weight on your shoulders that, listen to me, you will not be able to bear. So this was an incredibly big point because I can say growing up in a family where the Bible was around, but it was never opened, like the the Bible was never really read in my home. And, you know, I kind of found faith on my own as a teenager that, you know, the, the Bible was just kind of this thing that, you know, I became saved, whatever, whatever that meant at the church that I was going to at the time. I go out and get a, a teen Bible with like all this crazy colors and stuff on the, on the, on the cover and all this, you know, really cool graphics on the inside. And that was just the Bible. So it's like, okay, I need to read this thing because apparently God lives in there and I need to, I need to find it. And so I can see how most people think of it as a roadmap to life. But if you think the Bible is a roadmap to life, it does kind of give way to that same feeling in those same ideas that this is all about us somehow, that this entire thing all these ancient manuscripts that have been put together for us so conveniently into this book is all about us, right? And so there were a lot of points made in this entire sermon that he delivered, but I'm going to talk about one point. And and so this is like, if you had to sum it up, this is the point about his sermon. And so he even sums it up himself. So I'll go ahead and read his quote here. So if I could take this whole message and kind of just boil it down and condense it into its purest form, here's simply what we're celebrating here. That despite me, Despite my continued failures, despite my shortcomings and foolish heart, God, because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ to me and his wrath absorbing death on the cross and his resurrection, now sees me as perfect and spotless and holy and not because I am, but because he is. God so owns the glory that everything is his. That's why no one should walk with a swagger in the kingdom and no one should walk with a limp. I love that quote. That's why no one should walk with a swagger in the kingdom and no one should walk with a limp. So uh, he even went, went further with his summary and he kind of talked about basically the two reasons why it's good news that God is for God, right? Because he, he talked a lot about how this, just the content that he was speaking on, especially at this revival at a church like Elevation Church, this was jostling a lot of people, right? He mentioned that several times, that it's kind of shaking them foundationally. Like, oh, I don't really know how I feel about this. Like, what exactly is he saying? What does that mean? I have to change and those types of things. And so basically he wanted to kind of provide some solace by giving the two reasons why it's good. So the first reason was, is since God is for God, he's not after our begrudging submission, right? He's ferociously about our joy ferociously about our joy. So he made a comment that heaven isn't a place for people that are scared of hell. It's for people that love God. Like that's what heaven is, right? And this is where he kind of made very interesting points about the law, about how this is how the law comes into play. Because the reason that the law is there is because God designed life. So if you're a designer, but then you don't provide someone a pathway to do whatever it is, the thing that you design, that's, that's a little bit weird. It doesn't make sense to do it that way. He designed life and he knows how to do it best. So that's why the law was given to us to be like, this is how you do life best. This is how it built you to do these different things. So again, yes, yeah, since God is for God, he's not after our begrudging submission. He's ferociously about our joy. And the second thing is since God is for God, you are not the center of the universe. He drove that home, right? And so you kind of had half the crowd at that point, half of them were clapping, the other half was still like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. But the biggest issues in our lives are because we are all about us. He, He makes that declaration immediately that when you are the center of the universe, everything is trying to revolve around you, at least in your brain. And maybe in your psyche and, and, you know, how you operate in modern society, maybe that's your philosophy, right? But like the more that's true, the more angry and tired you'll be. And the less that's true, the more free you'll be. That's one of the big things, big things that he said. And so this, this messaging should have been very, very, uh, I guess it should have really shaken the foundation of some of these people, right? And so, but that's on an individual level because this is a revival. So you have members of Elevation Church there. You have members of the community. You have people that are, you know, coming to church for the first time. You have people that are running the whole gamut. So that was kind of the initial point, right? But then I want to talk about, you know, I guess what I'll call the point part two, but this isn't like the point in terms of, hey, this is the point of what I'm saying. This was a point as in he was pointing fingers 
at Elevation Church and churches like it. It was very clear what Matt Chandler was doing towards the end of the sermon, and and he didn't exactly hide it. Um, He talked about how if you fall in love with a preacher or with a preaching style or a worship leader or a worship style, that that can kind of weave into the ethos of your church and of your attitude towards ministry, and that that could actually be opposed to the things of God and how dangerous that could be. And he made the quote that Israel never did good with blessing, but they always did well with a whack to the head, right? So at this point, the entire sermon, you know, he kind of mentions Stephen Furtick and he, you know, mentions the tension there and says, we got to get underneath all this. And he's saying these things. And again, the crowds, you know, they're trying to cheer in other times. Other times it's like, ah, you know, they didn't know if they could even laugh. But what's really strange is pretty much right after he makes the quote that Israel never did good with blessing, but they did well with a whack to the head. He kind of got the shut up music. So I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but if you've ever like watched like the Grammys or Academy Awards and someone's like really getting into their speech and they, you know, really got to go to commercial or something like that, you'll hear the music kind of come up in the background. It just kind of rises slowly. And that's kind of their signal to be like, all right, your speech is done. Wrap it up. You know, we got to go. So he gets music coming in the background. Now, I know you you may have not noticed it that way, and I can certainly be wrong, but it's kind of, you know, towards the end of sermons at certain points, there's kind of like a signal. And that's whenever, you know, the, the organist or the piano player or the guitarist, they, they start playing. But Matt Chandler, the, the reason why I think that this was like shut up music, like, holy crap, we need to get this guy out of here, is Matt Chandler proceeded to talk for the next 10 minutes, right? I mean, that is either the longest, like, runway to get towards, you know, the prayer at the end. Or they were trying to wrap him up a little earlier than he wanted to, but, you know, nonetheless, he just kind of kept going. So that kind of wraps up uh, basically a summary of the sermon, but there was some fallout after the sermon as well. And again, um, the the guy talked about the beginning on his website, he kind of goes through some of this and I pulled some of it myself. But um, when you're watching this, you could kind of sense the tension in the room. I mean, I certainly could because I followed both of these men's ministries somewhat closely. The crowd didn't always know what to do. They didn't know if it was okay to clap. They didn't know if it was okay to laugh. Sometimes they just went with it. But another really interesting thing is that Stephen Furtick wouldn't clap. I mean, literally, Stephen Furtick is sitting to Matt Chandler's left, not 10, 15 feet away. And so whenever they would do a wide shot, you would see all these people clapping and you never saw Stephen Furtick clapping. So that was at least interesting, right? I'm not going to impugn motive on him, but that was at least interesting. And then at the end, you know, as Matt Chandler is doing his, um, doing his prayer, you know, they're getting uh, the drums and the, and the music set up in the background. And you can kind of see that. And Stephen Furtick is kind of walking back and forth behind Matt Chandler. And he's, he looks like he's in a daze. Like he was just kind of like, why in the world did I invite this guy to my church? Like, and again, I could be reading into it a little bit too far. I'll reserve the right to be wrong here, but that that's kind of what it seemed like. And, but here's the interesting thing about what kind of happened. So normally what happened again, this is a 12 night event that they did at the beginning of the year after each night's presentations during the code orange revival, elevation church would rebroadcast the sermons for those that missed them live. Because again, this was live streamed and it was presented live. And so they did that after every night's presentations, except for the night after Chandler's presentation. His sermon was conveniently not rebroadcasted, right? Again, this was going in the face of what they had literally done programming wise for days and days leading up to this one. And then all of a sudden this one wasn't put up. So Elevation kind of got called out for that. And so Furtick tweeted like this half-hearted apology, and then they finally uploaded the sermon for others to view. Okay. So, you know, crisis averted, you know, they may have tried to you know sweep that one under the rug. Maybe it was an oversight, who knows? we kind of got a hint as to, to, to which it was because three months after the event, right? Elevation church, they put together a highlight video from the code orange revival. And in that highlight video, they had all the speakers, they had, you know, the, the people that were doing the music, but there was only one speaker that was left out of the highlight video. I'll give you three guesses who it was, but I think you only need one. It was Matt Chandler. He was the only speaker that spoke during those 12 days that was not included in the highlight video. Okay. So you at the very least have to question the wisdom of that move, considering that they were already put on blast for not rebroadcasting the sermon after it was delivered. But you're almost bringing more attention to yourselves by not including Chandler again, 
right? You, you tried to hide it the first time you got called out and then you were pretty much forced to put it up there based on, you know, public outrage. But then it, it almost seemed petty on the back end that, you know, here it is that you bring this guy in. He didn't preach on a message, uh, the way that you wanted him to, and you just kind of leave him off. So, um, the thing was, is this was after, and again, like I told you, I went back and watched the intro that Stephen Furtick gave. This is after that slobbering intro that Furtick gave for Chandler, where he spent several minutes talking about how he wanted all kinds of different styles to be spoken at the revival, not just one style of preacher, but that kind of rings hollow when you basically try to make it as if the guy never presented. So that's a lot of different content. And again, if, if you stopped early on to watch the entire thing, which I certainly encourage you to do, um, it's kind of, you know, you, you've heard of what I had to say about it. Maybe you heard, you know, what other people have had to say about it. You have your own thoughts, but I have three thoughts that I want to kind of put forth that are going to kind of wrap up all this. So basically what, what do we make of all this that happened with this sermon and all the different things that happen around it? So the first thing is that Chandler could have gone up there and fished for applause like all the other speakers, but he brought fire instead. That's, that's what he did, right? And, but this was a cleansing fire, right? This is a fire that could make everyone and everyone's ministries better, right? To, to focus on the fact that God is for God and that we are not the center of the universe. And so one thing that I, I found interesting, and this kind of is close to home for me, is that he had Craig Rochelle come up there and speak. So as you know, I'm, I'm in the Oklahoma City area, and my wife and I attended Craig Rochelle's church, Life Church, for over 10 years. So went there for a very, very long time. And when you're at a place for any length of time, you can kind of see trends, right? You can kind of look back in time and kind of start to connect the dots. Um, and one thing I noticed is that over the years of me going to Life Church, there was a definitive change in Craig Rochelle's style, right? His style of, of preaching. Um, he, he would even say at different points, like, if no one would start clapping, it'd be like, that's good preaching right there. And then everybody would start clapping like, oh, that's our cue that we need to start clapping, right? And so that just always kind of struck me as strange. But then around that same time where, you know, Craig was kind of trying to, to go for the applause, uh, th those types of things, get everybody like fired up. He was spending a lot of time actually with Stephen Furtick and he was going to his church. And so, you know, Stephen Furtick's church would be so fired up and so crazy and, you know, like, you know, screaming and hollering and having a good time. And then he would come back to, to our church in, you know, Edmond, Oklahoma, and it wasn't the same type of excitement. Right. And so he was trying to almost infuse that. And then Craig, Craig's style. And again, I'm not, I'm not hating on the guy. Life church is probably the greatest evangelical church on the planet. So, so don't misunderstand me. And I know there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast at attend life church. So certainly don't, don't take this as I'm, you know, going after uh, life church or Craig Rochelle, <clears throat> but it seemed that Craig Rochelle's style over the years has been centered more on, Hey, what is a quote that I can say that people will remember? And then I'll build a sermon around it. Right? So I need, I need pretty much this entire sermon to be encapsulated on an Instagram quotable type of thing. And then I'll just kind of go around there. So, um, the thing is, is when, when pastors start to focus on, you know, looking for applause, uh, it has a tendency it's not all the time, but it has a tendency to kind of water down the message that they're trying to spew, right? Whatever that message is and whatever the context, it could be in business, it could be in coaching, it could be in leadership, it could be in the church or whatever. And so the thing that's interesting here is that you had a lot of pastors that were speaking at this event that they were going up there trying to get laughs and trying to get applause, right? And then you have a guy like Chandler come in and basically he's like, I'm going to put all my chips in the center and I'm just going to bring it. And so I certainly appreciated that. And again, just to reiterate, so I don't get any angry emails, I'm not hating on these other churches and their other ministries, right? I'm not trying to pretend as if there's one way to go after people, right? And one way to bring them to the kingdom. And there's a lot of great things that those other people have done. It's just a little bit different, right? So again, uh, kind of a second point of kind of what to make of all this is that Chandler, during this sermon, he kind of puts, you know, cheerleader preachers on notice, right? So I, I kind of call, you know, these types of guys, cheerleader preachers. So you got your Stephen Furtick's, your Craig O'Shells, uh, think Judah Smith, Carl Lentz, and I guess, you know, the varsity, like the, the president of the cheerleader preachers is Joel Osteen, right? So these are people who do focus a lot on what God can do through you. And then Joel Osteen is, you know, it's almost, it was almost unfair for me to mention those other four guys with Joel Osteen because Joel Osteen is so far on the prosperity gospel side of things. It's, it's ridiculous. So, uh, I probably shouldn't have said all those together. There's a definite difference between the first four I mentioned and then Joel Osteen, 
But the message here that I think Matt Chandler was saying, even from a macro point of view, is just be careful. Just just be careful if you're running a ministry. You may grow, but in what direction are you growing? Okay? So uh, even further than that, you may be attractive, but what are you attracting people to? Right? Like you, you might be a mile wide, but you're probably only an inch deep, right? So that's the thing that I think it's, it's important for these people that are in these ministries to think about is how much depth are they bringing, right? Uh, how are they discipling folks? And so I think that's, that's an important thing that we get out of here. And the last thing is we should put ourselves on notice, right? So Chandler put, you know, these cheerleader preachers on notice, but we should put ourselves on notice and think about what we're doing within the church the churches that we serve, right? You know, the local churches that we are supposed to be serving, the, the body of Christ, right? How, how are we operating in these different areas? Are we, are we feeding and being fed, right? Are we doing things that are allowing us to do things for the glory of God because it's his name that we're after, right? And, and I'm, guys, I'm not hovering above this situation myself. I've done a lot of things selfishly, you know, trying to find churches that meet my needs and worship services that are more my style. I've done all those different things, right? And, and, and I'd be the first one to tell you that those were not good things for me to do. But this puts ourselves on notice. Like, we've got to be able to be thinking of, to ourselves and of ourselves, what are we focusing on? Are we considering ourselves to be the center of the universe here? Is the Bible about us? Have we looked at all these people in the Bible and it's like, oh man, I, I really think I'm like Peter or gosh, you know, my story is really close to Paul's and, you know, David's a man after God's own heart. And gosh darn it, I'm a man after God's own heart. Like, I think we should be able to do this thing. So uh, again, I think Chandler did a lot of things in this message. I think a lot of the things that he did were intentional and there were a lot of ancillary things that kind of came that probably weren't super intentional. But <clears throat> again, as I kind of sit back and reflect on this entire sermon, I think it's incredibly important to realize that we will have messages that come and go in our lives and a lot of things that we'll, we'll, won't remember in any context. Maybe we go to a TED talk or we go to like this, you know, big sermon series or something like that. And there's just things that don't resonate with us. But I really do believe that this sermon that was delivered back in 2012 is one of those sermons that we can constantly go back to and look at and use that as an anchor point, depending upon where we're at in our lives. If we ever feel like it's about us, that the whole point is us. I think we can go back to this message and reground ourselves, okay? So guys, well, let's do the quick resilience boost before I let you go. As you know by now, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. And specifically, we do that by providing content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So today, we're gonna hit all three, spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So obviously, on the spiritual and the mental side, I want you guys to go and watch this sermon, <clears throat> okay? I mentioned it earlier. I gave you enough time to pause it and go and watch it. So watch that. Uh, watch the um, the kind of the recap that was by that other guy's website. So watch that as well. Both of those links are here. But then the other thing I want to do for physical is I've talked a lot about this on Instagram, but the, the Murph workout is coming up here in a couple of days on Memorial Day. So if you don't know what that is, Google it, the Murph workout. Um, so if you go to our Instagram, so if you just go to Instagram and it's at Undaunted Life, every two Tuesday, I post a workout of the week. So the last several weeks, the workouts have kind of been more centered on, you know, pull up, push up, squat stuff, stuff that's going to be very, very integral to being able to do the Murph. So that would be the little boost I want to do for you guys. I've had a lot of guys reach out to me and say they really like those workouts because I try to do most of them in a way to where it's like, you know, you don't need anything. You could do them in a hotel room. You could do them in your backyard. You don't need a bunch of weights all the time. Like at the very most, you can do a bar. But at one point, I didn't have access to a pull-up bar. I literally found a tree that had a horizontal limb that was really strong. I did pull-ups on that thing. So there's things that you can do for that. So make sure that you check all that stuff out, okay? As always, guys, thank you so much for listening this far in and getting to the end of the podcast. If you like this, please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. If you tag us in the post, we will make sure that we like it. If we deserve a five-star review, please leave one. And as I've reminded you before, I am currently booking speaking engagements for 2018. You can hit me up at info at Undaunted Life. I'll come speak to your men's group, your Sunday school, your conference, your team, whatever you have me to do. I'll come in there and do it for you guys, okay? Website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Undaunted Life or facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. You can also check out our free devotionals on the YouVersion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. 
And we also want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song King of Sorrow, which is off their latest record entitled Phantom Anthem. And they just released a music video for that last week, so you can find that on YouTube. Links to all this are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. Oh!